You know, all of us have opportunity to be great, to do great things. But like, just like Jack, was it? Was it Jack? Can be slack. You see, the fact of the matter is, most of us actually don't really grab this picture as well as we could on the whole perseverance deal. Most of us don't know what it is. Some of us get partway through the journey on things and we get really frustrated. So let's have a look at what perseverance is really about. Perseverance is to persist, to keep on going in an enterprise or undertaking in spite of difficulties, counter influences, opposition or discouragement. That's what perseverance is about. And some of us stop because of some discouragement. Some of us stop because of some difficulty. Some of us stop because we lose a vision. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if the gentleman we saw earlier had given up after five attempts at light bulbs? And how many thousand did he do in the end? Anybody know? Before 10,000. It was over, over 10,000, I think it was the right figure. You know, he never gave up. <laughs> Look at us. Actually, some of them are leads. He didn't invent those. Somebody else did that one. But at the end of the day, you know, that's the reality. Let's think of some other situations. See that thing there? Some of you might know what that is, and some of you will have no idea what that is. That thing stands this high. It took me nine years to make. It's just been picked up by the guy I made it for, and I told him it'd probably take at least two to three years. And, not, and I said to him, oh, man, I'm so sorry it took so long. Oh, six years is a long time. He said, no, it's not. It wasn't six years, Gary. It's nine years. <laughs> he persevered. His wife rang me up one day, and she when he was in Australia and said, uh, how's it going with the turbine? Um, Gordon wants to know. And I, I said, well, I'm actually very close to finish. She said, well, I hope you finish before he dies. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? But, and I, my wife will tell you, I wanted to kill this thing sometimes. I wanted to get up there and beat the hang out of it. It would have beaten me. This big bit of stainless steel and... What looks like a machine that you don't understand there is a turbine for generating electricity and there's the inside of it, the blades. And uh, that nine years, when Gordon came and picked it up and he looked at it and he caressed it and he liked it and I was feeling so bad I didn't want to charge him how much, you know, because the promise was that we'd, we, you know, he would get the machinery for me to make the thing, and that was part of the deal, and the cost of materials. Well, stainless steel was worth about $3,500 altogether, and so it was a long journey. And, 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 you know, sometimes I just didn't want to face it, and I had to get up, I had to go down the, my shed, and I had to keep working hundreds of hours. Just the head alone the bit that holds the blades, the piece in the middle there that is behind that ring you can see, took about 360 hours to make. You know, just that one piece. Now, I want to tell you something. When he came and picked it up and he caressed it and he took it, I felt so good. <laughs> Actually, I also felt immense relief. <laughs> We see, this is the deal with perseverance. When you achieve what you're trying to achieve, there's a great outcome. There's great outcomes. And um, I, I wasn't going to put those photos in until just before the service and something happened and I thought I, I should put them in. Because at the end of the day, that's a creation that nobody else has made. I have the satisfaction nobody else has made one like this, this little lever on the side here that you can see if you look at this little lever here with the bolt there. That thing means that this whole machine can be adjusted while it's running. There's no other turbine that small that can do that. 
Just an idea God gave me. I can't take much credit for it because I'd go to bed at night trying to solve a problem. I'd say, okay, God, I don't know how to fix this one. It happened the other night. And I woke up in the morning and he'd give me the answer during the night. I can't tell you about a process or anything like that to happen. I'd like to say that, you know, I, I thought it all through. You know, I did think some things through. But you see, when we persevere in the right way, we're going to get rewarded immensely. That machine is capable of generating 6,000 watts on a very, very low head. Most turbines need 30 to 50 metres head to generate that kind of power. This can generate that on 7.5 metres head, which is nothing. So, so, you know, all of us have things that we do. We could go to your homes. Well, maybe not all of us. Some of you would have things where we could go to your homes and we find something you made. When we were in Tasmania... We were on an outreach and we met this Hungarian guy who was dying of cancer. And he was an amazing guy. He, had, uh, he used to do what's called tatting. And he, and, and he made these doilies. And he was so fast at it. I mean, it's a thing that most women do, but back in his country, it's fine for a guy to do it. I remember when I was a kid, the first scarf I knitted now, some people in city life go, oh, man knitting. In the country, you do everything or anything. You know, there's no, no limitations. It took me a long time because every time I pulled the stitch, my mother would be watching and she'd be saying, you pulled it too tight. Well, that's too loose. I'd do a whole row. That's no good. Undo it. And she'd pull it off her needles. And she wouldn't go back one row. It'd be about three or four rows. And... It took me a painstaking long time to get there, but this guy was tatting very, very fine thread, very fine thread, and made these doilies. And, and he said to girls, I'll make you a doily each. Pauline and the other lady that was on our team, and he made this, these things. We sat and played Scrabble against this guy whose second language was English. He learnt it by reading the dictionary. A bit like Bok did that too, eh? He just he used to always carry a dictionary around his pocket, Bok did, and... Uh, and uh, we couldn't, a whole team of us teamed together to try and beat him at Scrabble. And he knew English language better than us. He went through the dictionary. How many have, uh, have persevered through a dictionary? Not me. You know? I mean, this is perseverance. This is, and, and the thing was, the skill that comes out of the things that come out of your perseverance are actually awesome. So we're going to look at a biblical worldview on this tonight. Some examples of perseverance, we've already seen some video, but I just want to touch on three examples very quickly. The first one is Moses in Exodus. Can you imagine him going to the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh saying, yeah, 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 I'll do it, because God had hit them with one more plague, and, and so Moses goes away, yeah, hey, telling the people, hey, we, we're going to go, we're going to go. If the Pharaoh's told us we could go, and then when they went to go, no again. And this is serious business, because... There was life and death stuff. It wasn't just giving you permission to walk out the door. This was life and death stuff. These people were the servants of the Egyptians. And God was saying, and, and uh, let my people go. And he said it through the lips of Moses. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. You know, the interesting thing is, there were several groups of people who persevered here. There was Moses. There was Pharaoh. There were the Hebrews who were getting frustrated as anything with Moses because he kept promising what he couldn't deliver. And then the Egyptians themselves, they were getting frustrated. They got so frustrated and then they, they, they kind of, you know, God kept hitting them with another plague. And the Pharaoh says, okay, you go. They, and they're probably pretty relieved. And then Pharaoh changes his mind. And so they can't go. And so the people suffer another plague. And, that, you know, I'm sure some of the people who are really good thinkers said, Pharaoh, for goodness sake, get rid of this lot. They're hopeless. When, when, you, when you don't agree to this thing, uh, they just keep going back to their God. And look what's happened. Rivers turn to blood. Frogs jump all over the place. Everything goes wrong. Now you, and the, finally the firstborn died. That was a real hammer blow. And in the end, Pharaoh was forced to let him go. But see, Moses had to persevere. 
because he could have lost his life every time he went in front of the Pharaoh. You've got to understand this. It's not like going talking to the king. Or well, even then, you, you, you probably wouldn't get permission to go and talk to the queen nowadays. Every time he went in front of Pharaoh, he risked his life. He persevered and got the results. Amen? Hey, imagine if he'd given up. There would be no crossing of the Red Sea. There would be no victories, one after another after another. Yeah, there were failures in the middle because sometimes they didn't persevere. But at the end of the day, that wouldn't have happened. The second one, Nehemiah, when they rebuilt Jerusalem. They had opposition. They had people who were meant to be their friends who became their enemies. They had all this stuff going down, and it wasn't good. And at the end of the day, they just kept persevering. They had to carry a spear in one hand while they worked with the other because they were afraid of attack at the time because they'd been threatened with attack. And they persevered, and they rebuilt the walls, and they did an amazing time considering. It's an amazing story. The next story, Paul, he says, I press on. He got imprisoned, he got shipwrecked, he got, man, he got everything happened to him in his life. So there are three different people. But perseverance is not always an indicator of health. I want to say this because some people say, you know, I've I've persevered and persevered, you know, I'm hanging in with God, but this isn't happening. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what people do over and over again. I've watched it. This is a letter to a church. Which church is it? Anybody tell me? Sorry? Is it Ephesus? Right, thank you, Vivian. Okay. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found, found them to be false. Now, let's all read this next verse 3 onwards together. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. This is a real compliment coming from God. And then he says this, Yet I hold this against you. You've lost your first love. Do watch out. I'm going to take the candlestick away from you. Watch out. So I, wanna, I needed to touch on this because I think when people talk about perseverance, they don't think about both sides. You see, the tra- trouble is sometimes you can persevere and persevere and persevere, but if you've got a wrong attitude, it's not even worth it. You see, they'd lost their first love for the Lord. They're persevering because they felt they had to uh, when they, in actual fact, would have been far better to persevere because they loved the Lord and they didn't ever lose that first love. That's that's a that's a deal God's looking for from us. So that's a tough one. Let's go to some more positive ones now. Amen. Paul declared, I press on, as I mentioned before. But what did he press on to, to, to doing? He said, I press on toward the goal. So let's have a look at it a bit. He says in Philippians 3, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. In other words, the past should not keep influencing me. I need to strain to what is ahead. And look at what he says. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I press on. I press on to win the prize. I'm not doing it because I'm just doing church. I'm pressing on because the reason greater than me. Amen? That's got to be our motive at the end of the day. That's got to be our motive. The next one I want to have a look at. We are called to perseverance. It's a calling type thing. You might wonder why all those people are up there. Well, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us why. And then it leads into Hebrews 12 and it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, these great crowd of witnesses were people who had been faithful to God. Yes, some of them had failed at times. But they were incredible people who, in the end, stood for God. They'd persevered in difficult times. They'd been through things. Some had been cut in two with sores. And God commended them. 
Let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. You see, entanglement means we can't persevere effectively. And so he then says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, now listen to this. Perseverance isn't about just slowly chomping, chomping, chomping necessarily. It can be sometimes. You, my turbine, man, that was slow. Mm, I was my own worst enemy at points. But at the end of the day, the thing that, that we're called to do is to run the race. The goals at the end, that we, we know where we're headed. And if we keep our focus on what's marked out for us, then we're going to do great things. But if we start going, oh, man, I don't want to do this. You know, I don't want to be a preacher. I don't want to pastor. I'd far rather sit on the sound desk. I'd far rather sit in the congregation. Well, I don't want to sit, lead my impact group. You know, I'm just not feeling like that. Well, I don't want to do the ministry I've been doing because there must be something different I can do, you know. I know God's called me to it, but God, why can't you let me do something else? Because... I'm not finding the satisfaction I want to find. You see, it's not about immediate satisfaction. Perseverance is not about immediate gratification, satisfaction for yourself. It's about knowing where the mark is ahead of us and going for it because we know the reward at the end is greater than the reward on the journey. That's perseverance. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch, that's persevering now. The pain is... Okay, so <clears throat> there's no sense of hopelessness in perseverance. There's no sense of hopelessness. That poor guy out there looks totally like he's at a loss for things. You know, hope lives with it. When we have perseverance, hope lives with it. Let's have a look what it says in Romans chapter 5. It says, not only so, but we also, was it, rejoice in our how many of us rejoice in their sufferings? One or two do. I know some do. Mind you, you've got to think it like this. Sometimes we're the cause of suffering, so there's not much rejoicing to be had there, is there? I mean, all right. So, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance and character. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you see, hope lives with perseverance. Perseverance doesn't have an end zone which doesn't leave us with hope. Perseverance is there when we hang in, we, we seek to do things. I've seen Christians over the years who have not been willing to persevere. They blame everybody else. They don't take responsibility for their own mistakes and own problems or their own attitudes. And they blame everybody else. They don't persevere. And then they say, oh, my Christian life's so hard. Well, guess why? You know? It's me, 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 me. And when it comes about me, there's a problem there. And, and we, we need to watch out. You see, the whole deal of, of suffering producing perseverance and perseverance character and character hope it's so real. You know, for me as a, as a young Christian, I suffered from the, from the week, two weeks after I became a Christian, a week I told my parents I'd become a Christian. From that day on, I've suffered with my family. I have. My youngest brother and I have become quite close now, but I literally overnight from becoming a Christian lost the closeness to my family members. Just overnight, it was tough. But I tell you what, what it did do for me, it made me very determined not to let anybody else suffer that same thing if I could help them. And some of you know there's been occasions when people have gone through suffering and I, and, and I just keep, keep turning up like a bad smell. But it's a sweet smell. Because God does something. We, 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 you know, you cannot give up on people. I know, somebody just looked at me a moment ago and it flashed through my mind. You know, one person who's really struggling for a long time. I just felt I, I had to go to their house. And I went several times and they weren't there those times. But the last time I went, I really felt God was prompting me to write a wee note. And so I wrote the wee note. 
And God did wonderful things, and they're wonderful. You know, I'm just so encouraged. You've got to persevere for one another because you love them. If you really love people, you're going to hang in no matter what. Amen. Amen. That's perseverance because it brings hope. It changes your character. See, if I hadn't have been persecuted at home, I don't think I would have been the Christian I am today. It changed me. And it was hard. And it was, it's been rough. But you know the neat thing that's just happened recently? And gone and visited my sister. And she started hugging me the last two trips. That never happened. Something good is happening. I've persevered. You know, a lot of families, they, they get mistreated from their family. Christians get mistreated by their families. And they just give up visiting them. And they won't hang in. They won't go there. Pauline will tell you. We've gone back and back and back and back and rejection and rejection, rejection, rejection. But if you keep going back long enough, people run out of rejection ability and they start to appreciate it. That's perseverance. Amen? Okay, the next one. His promises make it worth persevering. His promises do. That guy there, anybody know who he is apart from Vivian? Because she probably is the one who will recognize him. Who is it? Who is it? Well done. Shanton, he got it All right. Give him a hand. Come on. Charles Haddon Spurgeon is his name. He's probably one of the most famous Baptist preachers that we've had. He's back, back in England. And um, he used to preach. Uh, and, and by the time he was 19, he, he had, I mean, 19 years old, he had huge numbers of people. And, and they used to print off his sermons every week and send them around the world. It sounds like a glorious story, but you've got to hear his version of it. Because he had deacons who were a pain. They wouldn't agree to things, and they dominated him, and they said, you young man, you will do what we say. And it was with that kind of determination and attitude that they presented. He talked about a, a, an interesting thing because he was a, a kind of a Calvinist in some ways, and he, he talked about the fact that... Um, he even doubted some of their salvations, <laughs> which is very unusual for a person in that persuasion. And, and uh, you know, he tells his stories, and, and he persevered and persevered and persevered. Uh, one, one or two times he, he, he couldn't persevere any longer with some of the silliness of these guys. The buildings were getting so full that people were fainting from the heat, the buildings. And uh, so one... One night he said, we've got to get windows, opening windows at the top of the building to let the heat out, you know. They didn't have air conditioning like we have nowadays, so you can pump air in here. And, uh, and so one of the old deacons who sort of, in those days, deacons led the church. And deacons are never meant to be leaders, according to the Bible. They're meant to be servants with a servile task. They weren't meant to be leaders. And, uh, and um, so one of the old deacons says, sonny boy. We're not putting windows in there. We will do, you will do exactly what we say. People will just have to be tolerant. <coughs> Charles Haddon Spurgeon had been persevering these guys for a long time. They're a real pain. So you know what happened? When he died, they discovered that an incident that happened didn't happen as they'd supposed, you see, because just a short time after, a few weeks afterwards, somebody attacked the church and broke a whole lot of windows in the church. And when they got to his private diaries after he died, they discovered that the person that Charles Haddon Spurgeon mysteriously knew how those windows had been knocked out. He knew, for example, that the candle snuffer, a great big long pole, the candle snuffer had knocked the windows from the inside out, and he said if the police had been observant enough, they would have seen that the glass was on the outside of the building, not the inn. So somebody had done it from inside, says Spurgeon. We all know it was Spurgeon. But I want to tell you something, though. Don't think that's okay to take shortcuts. Because persevering like that can leave you with a guilty conscience. I don't think Spurgeon would have wrote about it in his diary if he hadn't had some guilt. So here we are. In terms of this, 
It talks about, in, in the passage we're looking at, goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness leads to love. It talks about those things in that order. He said, if, for, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I think this is really interesting because perseverance is part of the deal, part of the process, just like the other lists that we've already looked at. Perseverance is part of the process of us being effective and productive as Christians. Sometimes we want to give up. We want to take shortcuts. We want to say, oh, yeah, I can't, I can't wait. You know, this is, this is bad. You know, things are going wrong, so I'm going to run. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to destroy my life. I'm going to, you know, all sorts of things that people say. You see, perseverance brings the fruitfulness. If you persevere, no matter what your situation, at the end of the day, God will actually honor you for that. So what seems hard will seem like nothing in the presence of the Lord. That's the reality. That's the truth. So let's have a look at the next one. Consider it pure joy, says James. He says, because you know that testing your faith develops perseverance. He's been talking about this. The, the tests they were, trials they were going through. And, and then he says, so, so he's saying here, consider it pure joy. Because it's the result of perseverance. You see, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking, not lacking, not lacking. I think my dear left ear must be a bit deaf. Not lacking. Still hearing it from the right. And I'm not lacking. Ah, it does work. See, see, God wants us to realize this. Perseverance is going to make us mature people. It's going to make us complete people. And, and when you think about this, we're mature and we're complete. We're well-rounded in God's eyes. doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, because if you're persevering, you're doing things God's way and, his, and, and you're pleasing His opinion, doesn't give a hoot what anybody else thinks or what anybody else might say. Because at the end of the day, if we are mature and complete in God's eyes, that's all that's needed. Humans will always say, you're not good enough. You know, some of the greatest people in history, when, after they die, there's a whole lot of wannabes who write about them and say how not good they were in some way, how they were not so good. Well, I want to tell you something. If they've pleased God, they've persevered, and they've done what God's want, and they've allowed Him to develop into maturity, and they're complete in the way that God designed them to be, nobody has the right to criticize you, to be negative about you. You, if you're on the journey, if you're taking one step at a time, you may not be down here in your perseverance yet, but that's actually not the issue. It's whether you're doing the journey the way that Jesus wants you, because you're being complete at that point. And, and look, you can compare yourself to somebody else, but don't do it, because what you will do is you will destroy yourself. An enemy will have his way, but perseverance means we'll stand up to what the enemy's trying to do. Amen? And my last slide. Perseverance, in, uh, per perseverance impacts us and others. It changes the world around us. You see, how we live matters to God. Because you remember, how we live is going to impact others because people actually matter to God, don't they? Amen? So therefore, if people matter to God, you matter. And God wants the best for you. He wants you to know the best. If you don't know him yet, I want to say this. If you, don't, you haven't got full connection with him, I want to say to you tonight, right now, that if you're willing to get before God and you're willing to persevere and do things his way, the rewards are phenomenally great. God wants you to know that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we, we want to come to you tonight. Some of us have been a wee bit impatient. 
sometimes for good reason, but Lord, we haven't always realized it's not God had good motive. Some of us have been impatient because you've given us promises and we haven't recognized the journey needs to be part of the deal. Lord, so help us to be people who are going to persevere, who are going to hang in, who are going to do things your way, who are going to listen to you and are going to see that hope and the great reward and the maturity and completeness happen for the joy that you talk about that's so abounding when we are willing to persevere. Lord, we want to grab hold of that tonight. We want to say seriously to you, God, help us on the journey. Whatever the things are that you want us to do, we're simply saying to you, we're available. If you've designed us for this thing, whatever it might be, Lord, help us not to to, to look at others and to see sometimes they seem to take shortcuts. But God, I know personally from experience, the number ones that appear to have had shortcuts are no longer there because they've cut right out. We want to walk the walk the way you've called us to walk it. We want to do the things you've designed us to do. We want to be the people you've called us to be. We want to be the, uh, the, the people you have uh, designed us to, to be creative with, Lord. We want to have the character. We want to have the completeness. And Lord, we want to most of all do what you have designed us to do in the way you designed us to do it because we know at that point there's great pleasure in your eyes and great pleasure in your words and great pleasure in us. And Lord, we want to please you right now and we want to please you every day. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. And they all said...